One of the least appreciated books in the standard works of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is The Pearl of Great Price. Here we have a collection of, what, 61 pages uh, that a person might be tempted to uh, overlook. I can recall one of my predecessors telling me that uh, uh, when it was first contemplated as to whether there should be a course in The Pearl of Great Price, that uh, one of the university personnel questioned whether or not there was enough material in order to last for a semester. Uh, at this point, I don't think I've ever gotten through the 61 pages <laughs> in the way uh, we teach The Pearl of Great Price, but uh, it's a remarkable book, and I've often thought that, uh, that Franklin D. Richards, who pulled together this wonderful little collection, probably didn't at the time realized the significance of what he was doing in terms of meeting a, a present need and in doing so uh, perhaps preparing something that would, that would uh, one day be a godsend to the Latter-day Saints in terms of one of the books of our standard works. Uh, and so today uh, what we'll discuss is the Pearl of Great Price, why the Pearl of Great Price, how might one approach a study of the Pearl of Great Price, what would be an approach that we might use. Uh, joining us today, Professor Andrew Skinner, Professor Joseph McConkey, Professor Camille Franck, Professor Richard Draper, Professor Michael Rhodes, I'm Robert Millett. We're members of the Department of Ancient Scripture in Religious Education. Uh, Brother McConkey, I've heard you uh, on more than one occasion talk about how you approach the teaching of the Pearl of Great Price with your students uh, the first day of class. Why don't you visit with us about that? All right. Uh, <clears throat> what I do, and uh, I've had some success in doing, is inviting the students to uh, outline the course. And the way that I uh, would do that is first introduce them to uh, the content of the book, which you can do quite simply. Now, uh, consider with me what you have in the Pearl of Great Price, and then let me just invite the group to do what a class would do, okay. and that would be to uh, outline the course. Now, what you have in the Pearl of Great Price is, first, the Book of Moses. The Book of Moses uh, consists of eight chapters. It comes uh, lock, stock, and barrel from the Joseph Smith translation. It is, in effect, the first eight chapters of uh, the book of Genesis. So you'd start with the first chapter, which is a marvelous uh, revelation. The entire chapter would be a restoration of text in which we uh, learn about the experience that Moses had uh, in point in time sometime after the burning bush and before he led the children of Israel out of uh, their Egypt Egyptian bondage. It divides itself into three parts. In the first part, Moses is uh, caught up into an exceeding high mountain and has this magnificent uh, experience with God. <clears throat> At the conclusion of that experience, uh, the middle part of the uh, chapter uh, recounts an experience that he has after the glory of God has uh, been withdrawn from him. And uh, Satan himself comes and uh, acts as it were, at least attempts to act as uh, his mentor and uh, challenge Moses to worship him. Uh, Moses uh, comes off victoriously in that situation, learning the great lesson that is associated with it, that he is to uh, discern between that which is of God and that which uh, is of the Prince of Darkness. And because of that is invited to uh, return uh, to the visions of glory that uh, began in uh, the first part of the book. So that's uh, the uh, kind of material that we use to introduce Moses and the book of Moses. Uh, chapters 2 and 3 in Moses would just be the inspired version account of uh, Genesis 1 and 2 that tell us the story of the creation. Uh, chapter 4 of Moses, the first four verses are a flashback to uh, the pre-existence, probably uh, Joseph Smith's uh, first encounter with the concept of uh, a heavenly council. And then uh, in the verses that follow, we have the story of the fall. Then in chapter 5, we have a marvelous account of uh, Adam and Eve's experience 
uh, as they've gone out together now into uh, the lone and dreary world. And so it's uh, an extract from uh, the dispensation of Adam. The sixth chapter is primarily, and the seventh chapter together, uh, an extract from uh, the writings of Enoch, the uh, marvelous experiences that uh, Enoch had, which includes a, a panoramic vision of uh, the history of the earth from his day down into the millennium. Then uh, the eighth chapter is an extract from uh, the experiences of and writings of Noah uh, as he goes out and de declares the gospel prior to the flood. So that's what we have in the book of Moses. Then comes uh, the book of Abraham, which of course we get from the Abraham papyri. Uh, we have uh, five chapters and three facsimiles. Uh, in the first chapter, we have this uh, remarkably uh, interesting account of Abraham seeking after what we would really understand to be uh, the fullness of the blessings of uh, the temple or of the priesthood. <clears throat> then we would have uh, in the next chapter, among other things, our most perfect account of uh, the Abrahamic covenant. Then in the uh, third chapter, we have uh, this wonderful uh, priesthood lesson that uh, begins with uh, uh, this magnificent uh, vision that he has of uh, Kolob and the stars of heaven and learns of the order of heaven. And then this interesting transition into a discussion about uh, spirits and the order of spirits. And then in the uh, final two chapters, chapters four and five, we return to the story of the creation, but we discover it's distinctively different than our earlier account of creation, because this account is uh, telling us about the uh, council of the gods where they created, as it were, a blueprint print for creation. So uh, that's what we have there. And the, of course, the facsimiles, uh, the first one, Ab Abraham on the lion's couch, and where uh, he is uh, the sacrifice, as it were. Uh, the second... Um, the hypocephalus. Uh, the hypocephalus, uh, magnificent overview of... Uh, really the universe the universe God's, God's yeah power. God's plan and power yeah uh, and again something that's closely related to what takes place uh, in the temple and then we have the third with Abraham sitting on uh, the throne of Pharaoh and some interesting symbolism that uh, would be there leaving that then we have uh, we return to another extract from uh, the Joseph Smith translation this time from the New Testament uh, this is uh, uh, the 24th chapter of Matthew, which is uh, the account of uh, the last day of Jesus' public teaching in his earthly ministry, where he uh, spends it in the temple and then at the day's end goes down to uh, the uh, Garden of Gethsemane and there in the privacy of that garden with the apostles, responds to questions for them. And they ask questions about uh, when the, the prophecy will be fulfilled relative to the uh, end of the nation of the Jews and the destruction of the temple and also relative to the last days uh, dealing with the destruction of the wicked. And, and what we see here is this magnificent cycle of events that he tells them will repeat itself in the last days. And then after the book of uh, Matthew, then we get to what to was and, and is uh, the first five chapters of the documentary history of the church, which tells us the story first of Joseph Smith's uh, first vision, uh, then in the story of the coming of the angel Moroni and the uh, coming forth of the Book of Mormon, and then the uh, story of the coming of John the Baptist and uh, the restoration of the Aaronic priesthood. We also have an interesting footnote uh, in which Oliver Cowdery gives his account of the restoration of the Aaronic Priesthood. And just as a little aside, let me note that I think it really is uh, significant that uh, priesthood is never restored save there are two men present or keys to accord with the law of witnesses. witnesses. So it is an interesting thing in the providence of these kinds of things that you have two testimonies of that event included in this account. And both Joseph Smith and both, Oliver Cowdery. Both the Joseph's and Oliver's testimony of that <laughs> event. And then uh, finally, we have uh, the Articles of Faith, 
in which Joseph responds briefly to what were, I would suppose, the most often asked questions or concerns raised about what Mormonism is. And so there's, uh, there's the panorama of what the book includes. Now, if you're the class, and we've given you that brief overview, uh, where would you begin? What subject would you want to start with and talk about first? It's obvious you'd want to go to the Premortal Council. We've got solid information there yeah. that's going to set the stage for everything else. We have uh, first that extract that we, that little flashback in Moses chapter 4, and then in Abraham chapter 3, this marvelous vision that Abraham sees of the preexistent council. So we have two of the finest texts that we have uh, in all of our Latter-day Revelation on the story of the Council in Heaven and uh, growing out of that a, a knowledge and understanding of uh, pre-earth life. So a wonderful place to begin. Then where would you go? It, well, I'd, and I'd say this, it, though it doesn't come to the fore there, it at least sets the stage for agency. Yes. <clears throat> right there. Um, and in fact, that's involved in the, the uh, uh, Abraham, or Moses chapter 4 verses 1 through 4 text, we talk a little bit about the agency of man there, and we establish the principle of agency, and we also have, remember in Abraham chapter, uh, yeah, Abraham chapters 4 and 5, the council of the gods, where they're laying the plans for creation, creation of the earth, so where should we go? The next creation. Logical yeah. but, but you also have Jesus in his rightful place as the center of everything. Yes, right at, the beginning. Beginning. at the beginning. And, the, and that's the, being the critical issue of, uh, of our heavenly experience preparatory to coming here, who will sustain and accept him as God's son and as uh, the source of redemption. Mm -hmm. And really the center of the universe. Uh, the stage well, yes. is said in Moses 4 and then you go to Abraham yeah. chapter 3. Uh, the whole story of creation is going to center in and around him. So we would tell that story. We would then, it would seem just naturally, uh, <clears throat> tell the story of the creation of the earth. And uh, in telling that story, uh, we have so much in the revelations of the restoration that the world doesn't have. And really, uh, uh, the heart of what we have is found here in the mm -hmm. Pearl of Great Prize. Mm -hmm. So we could tell the story of creation next, then what would you do? The fall. The, the, the fall. fall of Adam and Eve. Sure. We place Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, mm -hmm. tell that story. And then uh, if we want to talk about uh, the great doctrines of the kingdom, let's uh, get straight the story of the fall. So we've got, story, we've got uh, straight the story of the creation. And now we understand what it is that Adam and Eve fell from. And so and now we've got good. fallen man and that it was good. A whole That's different right. perspective. Mm -hmm. Part of the Lord's plan. Yeah, a part of a divine a plan. A fortunate fall, yeah. as we'd say. Yeah, fall forward. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, concepts that are totally distinctive to uh, a re restoration of the gospel. Well, so now we've got fallen man. Then you have to redeem them. And, and then, yeah, a reiteration of the necessity of Jesus Christ as the Redeemer. All right, uh, an announcement of the role of Christ as Redeemer, so, and we so, get that. So that would be the institution of the gospel or the first dispensation, the Adamic dispensation. Yes. The right? Lord yeah. revealing the gospel to Adam, Adam. and Eve. Uh, and, it, and it is the same gospel that we've got, and it centers in Jesus Christ and his redeeming role. So, uh, a wonderful and the first, test. And the first great thing he's going to teach him, Brother Richard, is the law of sacrifice, sacrifice yeah. which is just a type and shadow of mm, the coming of Christ. 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 The atonement Christ. of Christ. Yeah. And then from there, well, we then go. We can, go, we can go on to Enoch. Well, we've got this this uh, wonderful extract in chapter five of Moses of the dispensation of Adam, and then we'll go to the dispensation of Enoch. We've got uh, in the Bible, oh, Enoch oh, gets one six complete sentence. In Genesis. <laughs> he gets one complete <laughs> sentence, and, and here uh, nature and importance of prophets right from the very beginning. Wonderful uh, uh, concept of, of of the role of a prophet and the, and. Uh, how he is to function and, and how the Lord empowers him. And their dependence on the Lord is, is they, the growth. I think Adam, as we see him asking, why am I doing sacrifices and how far he goes in that Wonderful, lifespan. Uh, uh, material on obedience and, mm -hmm. uh, and how the gospel is taught, and this type of thing. All right, so now so you've you have got over 100 Enoch. verses, as it were, on the life and ministry of Enoch. Yeah. We've got 100 times in this little book on Enoch what uh, you can get out of the Bible. I, I remember going to a junior college once to answer questions for a religion class there about the church and 
And I started talking a little bit about Enoch, and I looked out at this sea of vacant faces. You know, I mean, I, and it dawned on me I was talking about something that I had assumed, I assumed they knew who Enoch was. And, and they didn't have an idea in the world. No, he happens to be Enoch one of the was. most enig enig enigmatic figures in the religious history. Yeah. And, and what we learn in the book of, uh, well, in a sense, the book of Enoch, but Moses 6 and 7 particularly, wonderful. So, uh, uh, dispensation of Enoch, where should we go? Noah. Noah. Dispensation of Noah, chapter 8. We learn some very interesting things, though the chapter itself is quite concise about Moses or Noah. Gives us a whole uh, different perspective of who he was and what he did, and so, why the floods came, and we, why the which flood we get came. nowhere else yeah, so except in the gospel yeah. of Jesus, Jesus Christ. Yes. Right. Exactly. Baptism of the earth. So uh, now we've got uh, Noah, right into Abraham, mm -hmm. and that leads Moses. right into Abraham. Very Abraham, and so we've got uh, we've got more good material on Abraham and a greater perspective of what. Uh, uh, he was about and about this uh, marvelous uh, covenant that uh, is really the, the story that everything else traces back to in the Old and New Testament from that point on. But it's the covenant too that was given to Adam, so it's not like it's starting yeah, it something... Yeah, didn't really begin with Abraham, That's but right. Abraham becomes the focal That's point right. of, uh, of the covenant. And, and there it's unfolded for us, so we've got the Abrahamic covenant, we've got the dispensation of Abraham. Then we move into Moses. And so just as natural as can be, you move into uh, Moses. That takes us back to Moses the first point. chapter of, uh, of the book, but uh, a wonderful account of how the Lord prepared Moses to uh, lead the children of Israel and uh, a host of other things uh, about the uh, creation and so forth and the preparation that was his to write the creative account. So you've got the dispensation of Moses. Well, then you have Jesus. And so you have the meridian of time. You've got this uh, interesting Matthew. extract from uh, the Meridian of Time, Joseph Smith Matthew, which divides itself uh, versus uh, they're asking their questions in verse 5, and uh, you get the answer to uh, the, the contemporary answer for their day down through the first part of verse 21. And then starting at that point, you get to the answer to uh, events of the last days. Mm -hmm. and, and we discovered the, the key that unlocks the whole thing are a series of verses and again, and again, and again. And so we see this cycle of history which repeats itself. All of a sudden it starts to dawn on the student, oh, now I see why we have to study uh, uh, Old Testament and New Testament because it's the key that unlocks the mm -hmm. future. Sure. Uh, it gives purpose to a lot of things. So we have the meridian of time and then Joseph Smith. And then Joseph Smith. And Joseph Smith has been foreshadowed all the way back in Moses 1. That's right. Uh, he's mentioned as... As one like unto Moses that would yeah. be raised up and restore things that had been lost that Moses had originally Which written. So this ties the whole story together. Exactly. What's he going to restore? Everything that reaches right back to the days of Adam. Adam, Adam and the dispensation of the fullness, the fullness of what? Of all past dispensations. So what you, have, what you have here, interestingly, and then if you think about it, I don't know how many dispensations there have been in the past, but, but we're talking here about seven major dispensations, all being represented in 61 pages. Yeah. And along about this time, it dawns on me that this really is a presentation of the, of the eternal nature of the gospel, the, the gospel from eternity to eternity. It is the perspective on, a deter on eternity in 61 pages, which is astounding, isn't it? Yeah. 61 pages? And you it, get all of that. Yeah, it's. Uh, and back in, in Moses chapter 1, it, 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 it carries that perspective not only to this earth are itself, but to the to all of the creations yeah. of God. Yeah, worlds and, without Now, we're not going to let you get distracted with that. No, heavens. Only in account of this earth give I <laughs> unto thee. Mm -hmm. But still, you can see that this fits where it fits in the midst of eternity, just as the prophet, like Moses, gets caught up on the high mountain and he gets to see where he fits in the midst of eternity, and just as we, as we uh, work ourselves through this remarkable text, get to see where we fit in the midst of eternity. eternity. Now, uh, back in the uh, Enoch panoramic vision, it reaches down, it gives, it gives these very concise little descriptions of uh, the dispensations <laughs> that will follow after Enoch, and then the uh, ascendance gives a description of our own dispensation, and, and then gives a description of uh, the millennium. 
uh, with the uh, New Jerusalem and uh, the city of Enoch coming back down to uh, join them. So uh, it expands our course at least to that extent. Mm -hmm. So now class is at word. You see what we've got in this book? We have got the most comprehensive course ever taught on the face of the earth. Do you think we have a semester's worth here then? <laughs> uh, well, yeah, but I mean, we really do. You want to talk about a text that you have to grow up into. Uh, this really has to be it. We're starting with the pre-existence. We are telling the story of the creation. We are telling the story of the fall. We are telling the story of the atonement. We have uh, extracts in this book from all of the major, <coughs> excuse me, gospel dispensations from Adam down to Joseph Smith and even prophecy that reaches over into the millennium. Now there's no uh, university that you can go to on the face of the earth and take a course like that. Other than here. Other than here. And Riggs. And, uh, Church College uh, of Hawaii. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. Well, you've got to have the Pearl of Great Price as... Yeah. Did, we skip, did we skip the Articles of Faith? Oh, yeah. We didn't, we didn't get to the Articles of Faith here, but I never get to a bit class either. <laughs> <laughs> Simply because there is so much to uh, talk about yeah. and not because they're not uh, uh, remarkable. See, well, I, we, we generally work them in where, where they fit. I well, mean, yes, that's they, right. They, they fit very comfortably within. Well, you see, if you schema. want to talk about do we have enough for a course, my father wrote an 800 plus page book on the Articles of Faith, faith alone. alone. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we've got material enough here. And every time I pick up the Pearl of Great Price to read, I'm going to ask the question could any man who was not a prophet have written this? Yeah. And, and it is one of the most powerful testimonies of Prophet Joseph Smith that you could ever have in your position. Well, well Joseph led us through a, uh, an organization of the Course. Now, l let me ask a broader question. Um, without thinking too specifically, let's think broadly, let's think comprehensively. What, what does the Pearl of Great Price have to offer us from a, from a grand perspective? And what are the great principles, what are the great doctrines that are, that are going to derive from the Pearl of Great Price? that we might be able to see there more clearly than any other place. Well, piggybacking on what Andrew's picked up already, and that is the Pearl of Great Price does center us over and over again in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. it, it, is, it is a testimony of, of His work as the pre-mortal God, as the mortal Christ, and as the po post-mortal God who will bring us into the millennium, executing salvation all the way through history. I love the verse in chapter 7 of Moses that calls tales of him of being as broad as eternity. Mm -hmm. And if we build on that rock, and that's the what rock we get of in Christ, the yeah, yeah. You, we shall never fall, never fall. I mean, I, I, that's, a, that's a remarkable description mm -hmm. that, that I think focuses very much on who See, he is. See, if, if you wanted the classic illustration, it just as concise as could be, of the plain and precious things that Nephi talked about that got taken from the a Bible text, particularly the Old Testament, here it is. Well, you start here. here. I, I was, I, I've been asked over the years, I'm sure you have, uh, by, by students, well, Brother Millet, what do you think is the most significant thing Joseph Smith restored? Well, where do you begin? <laughs> but you know, if I were pushed, if I were really pushed, I, I would almost say, well, at least one of the two or three most significant is this concept, that is, an eternal gospel. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it is the thing that gives purpose and perspective to so much. And, and the fact that we would find pieces and relics and remnants of the puzzle, of the Christian puzzle throughout cultures all over the world, uh, attest to this important truth, that we should expect to find Christ, Christianity, Christian doctrine, Christian ordinances from the days of Adam. Well, in a sense, the Pearl of Great Price introduces all of the other books of Scripture that we have in our possession. And then, very specifically, Moses chapter 1 gives us some rhyme and some reason for reading the Old Testament. Yep. It isn't just a bunch of nice stories. It is centered in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Moses 1 is the missing introduction to the whole Old Testament. So, so one thing, then, <coughs> is, is the concept of the overarching principle here is the, the concept of the centrality of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the, etern and the eternal nature of the gospel. And the eternal nature of the gospel mm -hmm. of Jesus Christ. It is truly from everlasting to everlasting. What else? Uh, let, let me show you something else. Uh, I, on occasion, go down and, and talk to the missionaries in the Missionary Training Center. And I will ask them to list the books of Scripture in their order of importance in missionary work. 
Now, we've got uh, the missionaries of this day well enough trained that you know that they're going to say Book of Mormon first. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when I say to them, no, no, it's the Pearl of Great Price, why, uh, they're all just really flustered. They don't quite know where I'm coming from. Most but of uh, us don't know where you're coming uh, from. Well, usually, yeah. usually, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or where I'm going either. Right. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you stop and think about it for a minute. Now, what, what have we got in the Pearl of Great Price for missionary work? The first vision. Well, to start with, it's the first vision. Absolutely <laughs> fundamental to present our message to the world. But it's not just the first vision. Because you see, what Joseph Smith is restoring uh, is not really just uh, the organization of a New Testament church. Organization doesn't save you. The genius of Joseph Smith is that he restores the Abrahamic covenant. Yeah. And where's our most perfect account of the Abrahamic covenant? Pearl of Great Price. It's the heart of our missionary message. Well, and the tie between Jesus Christ and the Abrahamic Covenant, which is so yes. often missing. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yeah. It, the, the two are inextricably linked. You can't have one without the other. All right, very good. What else? What other, what other overarching truths are coming through? You, you see what we're gathering here is that in the 61 pages, you have some of the most, what would we say, distinctively unusual Latter-day Saint, Saint doctrines. Mm -hmm. What else? The role of prophet. Okay, the role of prophet. Well, say, more. Way through. say more. Yeah. <laughs> we, we see the call of a prophet. We understand the nature and order of the ministry of the prophet through uh, inspiration and revelation. We even see such things as the growth of a prophet, how God works with people to bring them to his high and holy status. The fact that the prophet's ministry cannot be frustrated by man. The word will get out. And finally, what happens when the world accepts, in the case of Enoch, or rejects, in the case of Noah, the gospel of Jesus Christ it's is proclaimed. Foil, isn't it? it's, it's rejection or acceptance of prophets. Well, the, the nature and reality of Satan has to um, be one of the great restored doctrines in the Pearl of Great Prize. You remember uh, in the little book that C.S. Lewis uh, wrote years ago that's so popular still, The Screwtape, Screwtape Letters, he says in the preface, he says There's, there are two equally serious errors into which uh, a person in our day may fall. Do you remember what they are? One, to believe that there is no devil, or two, to have an unhealthy obsession with the devil. The devil. He said either of those work perfectly fine. Yeah. Uh, and when you, when you consider what takes place in the book of Moses, in that first chapter, when we learn that details concerning Moses' confrontation with the devil have been removed uh, on purpose, you come to appreciate that the devil would prefer that we not know too much about the devil. A paradigm for our own lives where great good is manifest, great evil will be manifest alongside of it. I think that that's a recurrent principle that we discount too, too often. Moses, one is an obvious, there's a less obvious uh, illustration of the devil. There is this, what I consider to be just a creepy scene in Moses 7. Oh, yeah. Do you remember the one I'm thinking of with Enoch? What does Enoch see? The devil with the chain, chain laughing. Chain laughing. laughing. It's just Horrifying. It, 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 it's, and, and it's a, a dramatic con, uh, contrast with very soon thereafter God weeping over this yes. same thing. Yes. Satan laughing, God weeping. Oh, There's good. a type of that in Third Nephi, isn't there? When, <laughs> with after the destruction of the Nephite, or that just before Christ's coming, and how Satan laugheth, yeah. and Christ is weeping. So the reality of Satan, very real, very real. But well, you've got the three pillars of eternity. The yeah. creation, the oh, fall, and the, and the atonement. atonement. And, and, and as to the creation, notice you have this wonderful preface in Moses 1, without which we, we don't come to a study of the creation fully prepared. Uh, that Moses 1 mm -hmm. serves for us as a kind of a, uh, what, a, a preparatory statement, a, um, a prelude, not just to the Bible, but to the creation. We learn why he does this, and he, we learn by whom he does this through that only begotten Son. Absolutely. And then and the just fall. Just how broad it is. I that, mean, it's yeah. much greater than this earth. That is correct. And we then you've got this, this this concept of fall, like we said, that's uh, so distinctive, so distinctive. It's a positive thing. Uh, I wanted him to do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they rejoice afterwards. And, and the atonement. And had it not happened, the, the whole of God's plan. Uh, 
purpose would have been frustrated. And Adam's transgression had already been forgiven him through the atonement of Jesus Christ. I've often wondered what, what, what <laughs> difference it would make in the Christian world if that concept of, I have forgiven thee thy transgression in the Garden of Eden, were understood, mm -hmm. you know. Um, it it right. would certainly center us much more on our own weaknesses and sins and imperfections than, than uh, hanging on to Adam's transgression. I've often thought, too, the third pillar of eternity that Joseph mentioned here. Think about what you have in this Moses 6, uh, 51 through 64 or so. Mm -hmm. Think of this. What you have here is Joseph Smith's translation of Moses' vision of Enoch's description of Adam. <laughs> Did I cover it's it? A lot of yeah, very well. Yeah. That's, uh, Joseph Smith's well, translation he's, he's of Moses' well. vision of Enoch's description of Adam. Mm -hmm. We're sort of looking through a long telescope, as it were, back to the past. Well, don't we understand from the time of Adam the nature of the Godhead? Because we learned quite a lot about the Holy Ghost, too in the Pearl of Great Price. Sure. Yes, yes. All right, what are, the, what are the great principles? What are the great doctrines, the overarching ones, the big ones are coming through? Pre-existence, pre of course, is, is, is central to the... Pro I mean, we have virtually nothing else about the, the pre-existence in the, the rest of the scriptures. There, there's hints of it, but in the Pearl of Great Price, we get a real concept of, of it and that we were there and, and participated in this, this planning session for what we were going to do here. And, and the eternal nature, not only of God, but the eternal nature of man, the, this concept of intelligence that, that uh, is, is brought out there in Abraham chapter 3. Uh, to me, that's, that's one of the most profound concepts uh, that have ever come forth. Distinctive as well and yeah. unique. Com unique. I mean, no one else, uh, no other religion has a, even a, a glimmering of, of this, this concept of the eternal nature of man. Well, and, and, and it's like Elder Packer said some years ago in a conference talk, you take that away and it creates such confusion, doubt, uncertainty, frustration in the world. You add that to the picture of the, of the world and you've begun to, to fit puzzle pieces in place. Sure and you begin to understand some things you couldn't understand any other way. Uh, I, I'm reminded of what Elder Orson Pratt uh, said. He said, uh, Joseph Smith, the prophet, probably did not pick up on Alma chapter 13 being a reference to the premortal existence. Yeah. Yeah, but he said, but, I, but he said, there was no question that he began to understand <laughs> pre-existence with the, the Bible translation with Moses chapter 4. Well, you know, it answers the, the, the question that, that philosophers and theologians have argued about for, for thousands of years. You know, how can a perfect God create man and then man be imperfect? How can man not blame God for creating him the way he is? And the, the, the perfect answer is he didn't. He yes. did not create what ultimately man is. Man is a free agent and, and uh, God provides him with his agency uh, and, and vehicles by which he can exercise that agency, but he is not responsible ultimately for what that person does or is. Good. I think there's uh, another one in with the New Testament link, and that is the reality of Christ's second coming and, and a clarity that not only, to, it's not given in any way that brings doom or fear. He gives us these signs we learned from Joseph Smith Matthew for the elect's sake so that we will not fear. That, to, to remind us, I think, that he's in control, that that these things are going to happen and that we can keep our eyes focused on him and look forward to the day of his coming rather than, with, with hope rather than fear. Good. I think closely associated with that one too, just uh, a little close to our own time, and that is the importance of the dispensation of the fullness of times, the importance of the restoration, the importance of restoration scripture. All the work that uh, God has done to make sure that everything is pulled together in, the, in these last days in preparation for the millennial reign of the Lord. Well, you were, you know, I'm reminded in this regard of uh, what really does prove to be an expansion and a commentary upon, uh, is it the 85th Psalm? Uh, Righteousness will I send down out of heaven, truth shall spring forth out of the earth. Yeah. There's the Psalm, but what, is, right. but what do we get in the seventh chapter of Moses? We get a real detail. We get, and righteousness will I send down out of heaven, truth will I bring forth out of the earth, speaking obviously of the Book of Mormon, to do what? to bear testimony of my only begotten, His resurrection, resurrection from yeah. the dead, 
and the, and the place of the Book of Mormon and the growing restoration and the establishment of Zion, the establishment of the New Jerusalem, to lead into the time when the Savior comes. And so you get this testimony again of here in Enoch's vision of all the things he saw, he saw this very critical time that we know is the dispensation of the fullness of times. There's a, it seems to me there's another theme that may be sort of subtle, but it is that of the importance of ordinances. Repent and be baptized, mm -hmm. and then the connection between ordinances and the Abrahamic uh, Well, in covenant. fact, going back, well, I mean, what do we learn? Adam is baptized. baptized. Adam is ordained. Right. Okay. And, well, uh, and coming with that one, we can't uh, leave out being born again, the change of the inner man. Good, good. So we've got the concept of the new birth, from the days of Adam and Eve. And, and also uh, one thing that, that we also pull out of uh, the explanation of facsimile too is the fact that temple ordinances are from Adam forward. Each, each man who holds the priesthood, part of, of holding the priesthood is, is ultimately that, those, those temple ordinances that, that bring about the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. God revealing the grand key words of the, the holy priest. priesthood to Adam and Seth so, and so forth. Right on. And any and every other person who held the keys of this priesthood. Exactly. Well, ordinances are conduits of power and revelation. Good. We get that clearly presented in the. And so you get this born again, place. but it takes us all the way to become like He is. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. that whole mm -hmm. full spiritual transformation. Anything else come to mind as far as great messages? Of, well, you uh, can see that the great capstone, the Pearl of Great Price, are the articles of is the articles of faith. Uh, because it, it, it's a summary of all of the great doctrines of the Restoration and, uh, and succinctly presented to anyone who will take time to look at them. Mm -hmm. All right, is there anything else we ought to say about this remarkably unusual but uh, heavy and impactful 61 pages? Well, just uh, one thing that impresses me, and that is the Pearl of Great Price did not come to be, come into existence as canon. The Book of Mormon is premeditatedly canon. Mormon knew what he was doing. He just absolutely knew. The Doctrine and Covenants, Joseph Smith was commanded to write the scripture for our day. But when Franklin D. Richards pulled together these wonderful gems, these pearls of the restoration, it was not canon, it was, it was scripture. But it was not designed initially to be a four standard work. It was designed to meet the needs of a day. And therefore, I think the Pearl of Great Price, Price teaches us the principle of line upon line, precept upon precept. And if I can capitalize on that a little, I, uh, I've shared with some before the interesting experience I had at, uh, at uh, Florida State University as in a biblical seminar where the professor is defining the word canon, the canon of Scripture. And he, if he had written once, he must have written ten times the words, canon means closed, set, fixed, and established. <laughs> one of the students, had, after about two hours of this, one of the students had said, well, what if, what if a book of Scripture were found and we could verify that it was indeed the Gospel of James or, or the Gospel of Bartholomew and it was, it was authentic? No, he said, it couldn't fit because the canon means closed, set, fixed and established. Well, we spent about two hours on that. We came back the next time, a week later, for our three more hours of session, and uh, he began again to write those words on the board. But this time I sensed he was a bit nervous, and uh, there was something not quite right. I thought maybe something was on his mind, and there was something on his mind. He put the chalk down, he banged his fist on the table, and he looked at me and he said, Mr. Millen, and there were only about eight of us around the table. He said, Mr. Millen, I said, yes. He said, will you please explain to us the Mormon concept of canon. I mean, you have other books of Scripture. How does it fit? And it wasn't something I was ready for. <laughs> but, I, but I looked up at those words on the board, and I said, well, I guess you could say that the Latter-day Saint con con uh, concept of canon is, we believe the canon is open, flexible, and expanding. <laughs> and then we had a really interesting discussion. Uh, and I think that's what the Pearl of Great Price illustrates that nothing is more set, fixed, and established, but that God will continue to speak to man over and over and over. It is, if you will, our invitation to attend the School of the Prophets and to stand, as it were, where Moses stood or Enoch stood and see the kind of thing that uh, they saw. It's absolutely marvelous. 
it is. And I keep thinking of the word value, the great value that this is to the Latter-day Saints. And uh, it reminds me of the words of Jesus. The, the kingdom is like a merchant man seeking goodly pearls. And when he finds that one pearl, a great price, he sells everything to have it. And that's what we've got. We have something here that is truly worth more than silver and gold. We've asked uh, Brother McConkie to lead us on a discussion of some of the scenes in the early stages of Earth's existence, the days of Adam. Joseph? Thank you. We have uh, in the book of Moses some remarkably interesting and instructive uh, material restored to us about uh, the man Adam, uh, the woman Eve, their family, and uh, key events uh, in that early dispensation. Uh, the two key chapters uh, in the book of Moses would be chapter 5 and then the early verses in chapter 6. Let's uh, look at a couple of verses here in chapter 5 and then uh, as commentary on their sons and daughters, on their family. Go over to uh, chapter 6 for a moment. But if you'll notice, uh, the fifth chapter begins after Adam and Eve have uh, left the Garden of Eden. We read in the first verse that uh, they labored side by side in the fields. Uh, we read in the second verse that Adam knew his wife and she bare unto him sons and daughters. Uh, a wonderful restoration that we uh, don't have, for instance, uh, in the Old Testament as it presently stands for us. And we read that they began to multiply and to uh, replenish the earth. And from that time forth, the sons and daughters of Adam began to divide two and two in the land and to till the land into ten flocks, and they also begat sons and daughters. So within the first three verses, uh, Adam and Eve are uh, grandparents and great-grandparents. If we want a little bit more detail, let's uh, go over to uh, the uh, sixth chapter. And we learn a little bit about uh, how uh, the family was uh, educated. We read in the fifth verse that a book of remembrance was kept. Uh, in the which was recorded in the language of Adam, for it was given unto as many as called upon, upon God to write by the spirit of inspiration. And by them their children were taught to read and write, having a language which was pure and undefiled. You know, you, so, get, you get here, Joseph, you get something presented very early, the notion that our first parents, or those who lived in the days of Adam, were not primitives. That is, we're prone to view history too often in a linear way in which we assume that everything that's back here is on a lower Everything's scale. Everything's evolving. Everything is evolving. But what we really find here is these people are being taught by God. We would presume that was pretty good instruction. And, uh, and given a language that's described as pure and undefiled, they, they have something from which it may well, we may well, well learn one day that we have fallen yeah. or well, have lost. Devolved. Yeah, it, we, it's the devolution of language that we're getting here and not the evolution, yeah. which I'm sure would uh, be very much at odds with uh, the uh, kind of theory that we would be taught in a classroom about yeah. uh, where our language came from. And yet, uh, most ancient languages are considerably more complex yes. grammatically than, than later languages. Than our own. You, you do see a, a devolution there as well. Yeah. <coughs> this, uh, so Adam's children, see, they study at uh, the University of uh, A&E. That's what their sweatshirt said, Adam and Eve. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Professor Adam and Professor Eve, they had the, the general ed requirements would be the three R's, reading, writing, and uh, religion, I suppose. Yes. And, and uh, revelation. And revelation. Uh, so they would have been uh, uh, well educated. Uh, we read that uh, this verse, in a way, doesn't flow with the others, but it's a very significant verse, verse 7. The same priesthood, which was in the beginning, shall uh, be in the end of the world also. 
Uh, but that's very important to the, the big picture in the story that we tell about a, a restoration of all things. Well, I think there's something else going on uh, that does make it seem to fit a little bit. I've noticed we're reading along and we kind of get a little hiccup right there, yeah. and especially since we haven't had an antecedent to this same priesthood in there. But we are talking about a, a family order and a teaching order. And okay. therefore, I think right. it's talking about the fact we've got family priesthood or patriarchal priesthood in operation here, and this is the way the families are organized and the, how the teaching gets done. Well, it, it gives to us, too, it's a short verse, but it gives to us a prophetic pattern of where we're headed as a church, and, and we see that. The focus on the family, mm -hmm. the, the constant emphasis upon how more and more things must be done by mom and dad. More and more things must be done in the family because that's the way it was intended from the beginning. Well, and books of remembrance are very, very important, and uh, there's a practical aspect to it as well. We ought to be keeping books of remembrance, not just for ourselves, but for our families also. And note, too, that this book of remembrance is not just genealogy. It's as they were moved upon by inspiration. This is the scriptures that they're yeah. talking about. Well, mm -hmm. in fact, what, what happens when uh, a book of remembrance is not kept and the language is not preserved? Mm -hmm. In the Book of Mormon, don't you have the disaster resulting from the non-preservation of these books of remembrance and the pure and undefiled languages becoming corrupted? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> One of the things that uh, is really interesting uh, here in the ninth verse is where you get this description of uh, God and, and, and man, have man being created in the image of God, uh, in the image of his own body, male and female created he them and blessed them. Now, uh, what we're restoring really is just three words to the biblical text, in his own body but they make all the difference in the world. We've mm -hmm. got now a, a corporeal God. Mm -hmm. We've got a God who is uh, a man. He is man of holiness, as we will uh, yet read. But I think uh, it includes the two, male and female. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and, and so there's an implication there. That's and right. again, this is, uh, see, I, I, we, we talk about uh, the text where uh, Adam leaves the Garden of Eden. Uh, where, where we're told, uh, therefore, will a man leave father and mother, mm -hmm. cleave unto his wife and none else? Well, it's a little tough to leave father and mother unless you have one. Mm -hmm. Now, the text That's doesn't uh, yeah. make a lot of uh, uh, reference there. to it but, it, but it's there if yeah. you're looking for it. Just as it's uh, tough to be created after the image of God's own body if he, he if doesn't he have a physical one. body because right. yeah. an image is a replication. Yeah. It is a, is a yes. copy of something. Well, and, and verse 10 makes that clear because then Adam has the son in his own likeness after his own image. The same yeah. words are used. And Adam starts doing the very same, same thing that God has done, yeah, begetting so sons and daughters in his likeness. Clear. Wouldn't you say this is probably one of the very earliest references to a doctrine that's pretty fundamental to Mormonism. In other mm -hmm. words, this is November, December, 1830. Yeah, it, it, uh, it isn't as if <coughs> anything is uh, an afterthought with Joseph Smith. The, uh, the seeds are all planted and everything progresses in a very natural order. Uh, the Book of Mormon makes a marvelous contribution to our understanding in, the, in that it uh, uh, defines resurrection for us and makes resurrection corporeal, something that is just law. You can read the Bible from Genesis mm -hmm. to Revelation. You never get a definition of resurrection. The Book of Mormon does that and makes it very clear that this, this is physical, this is tangible. You're getting body, inseparable union of body and spirit. Uh, the first thing that you do, I think, in uh, apostasy would be to uh, distort or lose the knowledge of God you take from him his body, and you've uh, you've changed the very nature of God. You place him in a you place him in a different species than man. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, and and so uh, when you've done that, that makes everything that's going to follow a figurative, uh, metaphorical kind of thing instead including, of a literal including thing. Including our resurrection. Yes. So here, uh, when he's got a body, and uh, these are children. We when we read back here that a genealogy was kept of the children of God, uh, we, uh, we're reading something that is quite literal. If Brigham Young was uh, telling you the story, he'd say, uh, and a genealogy was kept of the grandchildren of God, you see. So we could actually 
without much difficulty, we could have put together Adam's pedigree chart. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, it, it's done there in verse 22. This is the genealogy of the sons of Adam, who is the son of God. Uh, very plain and straightforward statement, which we would understand to mean simply what it says. Exactly. Well, and it helps us to understand the Bible because the genealogy of Christ in Luke chapter exactly. 3 eventually takes us back to Who God. Who was the yes. Son of God. I think they're talking literally. Mm -hmm. sure. Well, they have to be, but, it, but it's an interesting thing. Most of the world would say you're tracing back for 4,000 years, Well, and yeah. literal, 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 and all of a sudden you get to Adam, and oh, that's got to be figurative, but this is saying no. And, and we've got a second and a third witness, and a witness straight from a modern prophet's mouth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, these are the kind of uh, things that uh, just constitute uh, marvelous treasures. Let me point out one more thing here. Uh, of course, I would say this because I think it, but, I, but as we've just talked about in verse 9, um, male and female being there with as we talk about God, and, and what Andy just said, what Adam is doing afterwards is the very same thing. He has sons and daughters who are the sons and daughters of Adam. Um, verse 9 tells us that that Adam also has reference to Eve, Eve as sure? well. And very exactly. often when we use that term, we forget, but we can remember that Eve is included in that as the, well. In the that broad time. term, mankind. That's right. Because well, that's what that Adam right. means. Adam. This, is, yeah, this is a great <laughs> phrase here in verse 9 where it says, and, their, and called their name yes. Adam. Now, uh, I'll tell you what that says to me. That says that uh, uh, in, the, in the story earlier, Adam is invited to give names to everything. Name implies ownership, it implies responsibility, it implies dominion. Uh, Eve is entering into a covenant with Adam, and she is in effect saying, Adam, I, I will be one with you, I will labor at your side, I will sustain you, I will labor with you, I will bear your children, uh, and, and all that we do we will do together, and all that I do will be to sustain you, and I will take your name as a symbol of that. Mm -hmm. And Adam, in effect, is saying, I will give you my name. You are uh, mine. I will bless you. I will protect you. I will sustain you. I will provide you. you. I will sustain you in yes. all that you do. And that becomes uh, a, a marvelous metaphor for our relationship with our Father in Heaven. It's the same principle. We take upon ourselves the name of Christ, and we enter into that covenant and say, uh, we will labor in your behalf, and we will uh, sustain your cause, and uh, uh, be uh, advocates of uh, uh, the truths of salvation, and uh, in turn, you will protect us and provide for us and bless us. Uh, and it's just uh, it's uh, the same covenant again. Well, uh, let, let me pick up on that, too, and just, uh, again, uh, piggyback on something you said. When God creates excuse me, after Adam and Eve are driven from the fall, then God says, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. And it is interesting from there on out, we find that God always deals with them as a single unit. He deals with them as a single unit. Husband and wife now become, in God's eyes, one. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's the cause of marriage, is to make this oneness. And we see yeah. that, that taught very early here. Yes, we do. If you'll, in fact, uh, let's go back and, and uh, read it in chapter 5. Uh, you pick it up uh, here in the fourth verse. And Adam and Eve, his wife, called upon the name of the Lord. See, that's family prayer, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, and they heard the voice of the Lord. That's family revelation. That's family revelation. See, it wasn't Adam got the word and went and said, by the way, Eve, here's mm -hmm. uh, what the Lord wants you to do. They heard the voice of the Lord uh, from the way toward the uh, Garden of Eden, speaking unto them. Mm -hmm. And they saw him not, for they were shut out from his presence. So uh, Eve was also fallen, Camille. Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and yet, Eve, we got out of there. <laughs> and yet, Eve ate Adam out of house and when, <laughs> when the actual priesthood ordinance of sacrifice is performed, it then is it, Adam Then it, then it, it goes mm -hmm. back to, uh, and Adam performs the ordinance. the ordinance. Now, let's go back and uh, maybe pick up our story at that point. Could, could I just yes. make one other observation? It seems to me that they call upon the name of the Lord precisely because they are shut out from His physical presence, and that's pretty good reason for all people to call on His name. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, there, there maybe is another point there that we ought to uh, call attention to. 
Uh, I think it's important here in verse 4, if you'll notice, uh, they call upon the name of the Lord. Now go down to verse 8 and notice again, Wherefore thou shalt do all that thou doest in the name of the, the Son. If you turn over the page and you uh, look at uh, verse 10, uh, in the middle of the verse there, Blessed be the name of God. Uh, you go down to verse 12, And Adam and Eve blessed the name of God. Now in each of those instances, it would have been easier just to say, they blessed God, uh, or uh, they called upon the Lord, but it doesn't say that. It said they called upon the name. Now, we've got a doctrine of names here. There's a very important doctrine of names. And if you want to, what I would think would constitute at least some commentary on that, go over to the book of Abraham for uh, just a moment and uh, go down to the 18th verse there. Of which chapter? Uh, excuse me, the first chapter of Abraham. And go down to verse 18. The Lord speaking to Abraham, Behold, I will lead thee by my hand, and I will take thee to put upon thee my name, even the priesthood. Now, uh, I think that... Uh, there is something very significant that's involved here. I don't think that this is just a matter of uh, uh, semantics. I think that we're uh, talking when we use that phrase and go out of our way to uh, use it, that we're associating uh, their relationship with the Lord with priesthood and with priesthood ordinance. I think it's several things, in fact, Joseph. I think the other thing is consider that uh, the name of something. What is a name? It is something which identifies, it is a word or a phrase or a slogan that identifies the essence of something. Yes. So for example, if the Quorum of the Twelve were given an assignment that there to be special witnesses of the, the name, name of, of Christ, Christ in all the world. Not just the uh, witness of, not Christ. Just of Christ. The name of Christ in all the world. They are called and sent out and commissioned to bear witness of all that he is, of his essence, his power. Well, but, he is but it's God. also his priesthood and, of, and the government and of, of the church. That's right, of his and all kingdom. All the revelations that have come from him. And, and to see that all of those things are in order. Apostles just don't go out and, uh, and bear testimony of Christ. They go out and make sure that the church in, is in order and the priesthood is functioning the way it ought to and uh, that type of thing. Yeah. And all of those things would come under the heading of name. Those things yeah. bear his name and they're responsible to see that they're bearing that name properly. Well, there's something else too that's going on in the ancient world and that is when an exchange of names occurs, it connotes and denotes uh, an intimacy of the relationship. And, uh, and uh, you have text or documents from the ancient world that talk about people that don't know the name of this God or that God, therefore they don't have a relationship with and him. And to gain the name is to gain power with that God. With, with that God. And, and to erase the name would be to destroy the essence of. Right. So the, in, in Egypt they used to go around and chisel it's off the names, names of, exactly. That's of, right. the, uh, of the pharaohs, pharaohs well, and, and then he was lost. And this essence thing that you brought up is so critical because how many times in the Old Testament do we see the name of a person symbolizing the essence or course or direction that their life took? You know, you can think of mm -hmm. dozens of examples. Mm -hmm. I, I, there's enough involved there and, and again these are little things but there's enough little things in here that uh, I think are really profound that uh, you just have to say, Joseph is really a lucky guesser as he makes this story <laughs> up, isn't he? I mean, that little Joseph phrase Smith. in his own, yeah, Joseph Smith, okay. in his own body and, and the name of the yeah. son and, uh, and, and we'll find scores. Well, he did them. okay with a limited education. <laughs> he surely did.